My name is Helen larsen Poset, and I'm a curator of contemporary art, but I'm working mainly with heritage, with museums, with cultural heritage museums, uh, with collections, with researchers. Uh, right now, uh, I will talk about uh, a work I've done at the Swedish History Museum, but I'm right now working for the Swedish Heritage Board, and I'm also working for a new museum in Stockholm called the Women, uh, the Stockholm Women Museum. Uh, I'm also running, I'm founder of uh, a lab called History Labs. Uh, that is a method, we are trying to develop different methods, how you can actually unfold already existing museum collection and archives and to find what we want to see one day, what is invisible, what, don't, what do we not find in the collections. I'm very curious in that and I will tell you, I will give some, some examples. Uh, uh, this is what I will tell you. I will give you some inspiration, something that is inspiring for me, so you know who am I. Uh, but also I will talk about the history uh, of museums and archives, not just in Sweden, but in Europe. Uh, a little bit about representation and use of history, because I think a lot of, as Johan said, a lot of artists are very interested in representation, but also the, the creation and use of history. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about the History Unfold exhibition I did, and the, the big project I did and of course the artists that I have been working with. Uh, I'm an ethnologue, educated ethnologue, and uh, this is two ethnologues uh, wrote this in 2006 in a very interesting project, I will not tell you. It is essential for museums to take risks to dare to seek out difficulty to join with visitors in highlighting areas that are otherwise in shame or complete darkness. If the museums sort of function as society's memory, they cannot lead to the media to document the more problematic part of history. This was a, a project, a very important project in Sweden in 2006, that was about difficult matters in historical museums. Very taboo stuff. How can we actually deal with very taboo stuff? And complex, problematic issues in history museums or archives. Uh, Fred Wilson, I don't know if you know him, he's an uh, Afro-American artist. I, uh, one of his projects that has very, been very inspiring for me is mining the museum as Ma at Marian uh, Historical Society in Baltimore. Uh, he was invited as an artist to intervene with the collections. Uh, and uh, he did, but he didn't create his own artworks. He was just digging into the archives and he did something very interesting. For example, he was showing a, a lot of these kind of paintings that is in the collection of this museum, but he was highlighting, putting the spotlight of the young boy in the background. Or there is another picture where, where the, one of these young uh, white boys are standing with it, with the, uh, and you can see the leech that he has, ha he has in his hand. And this leech goes to uh, the, uh, the neck of a sort of black boy. So it's kind of highlighting, putting the spotlight on that. It was also uh, combining things. This is also uh, objects from the collection. And putting a Ku Klux Klan uh, dress together with uh, this baby um, wagon, it really gives a new meaning to the objects. And he did also this, putting together the slave shackles together with the silver uh, from the, the same collection. So to redefine, to reorganize objects from a collection can create new meaning. Uh, another artist I think is, I don't know, have you been to the Jewish Museum in Berlin? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is a very uh, important work for me because uh, it's Menashe uh, Lishma. Shalishet means uh, missing leaves or dead leaves. Uh, and in this, uh, he had put this, you can see these faces, 10,000 of these faces inspired by Edward Munch. Uh, and they made him in iron. And you are, as a visitor, you should walk on this. Faces. And it's an extraordinary feeling when you're stepping up on these faces and you're walking on them because they are starting to move 
because you're working on them, and they are somehow screaming. And it's a very uh, physical, very uh, strange and uh, uncomfortable feeling. And that is what I think um, artistic work can do. In, in this is also a history museum, the Jewish Museum in Berlin. I will tell you the story of the Swedish History Museum in Stockholm. It's one of the biggest museums in Sweden. I have been working with them for several years. Uh, they have 10 million objects uh, in their collection. Uh, it was from the beginning one of the kings, the Gustav III, his big collection that was the, the ground for this uh, collection in the 18th century. Uh, and the museum that you can see here is from 1866, uh, when it was part of the National Museum. Uh, during this period, in the 1860s and 1870s Sweden, Sweden was very poor, like uh, Johan said. Uh, during uh, the mid-19th century to the uh, 20, 1920, one and a half million Swedish people left the country because of poverty. They left for the United States, but also other parts of, of uh, Europe, uh, because of the, the bad, bad conditions in Sweden. Uh, then the, the government was very, uh, it was important for them to create some kind of national identity, something that you could gather around, symbols, an idea of Swedishness was very important. And the museums were one of the tools to actually create this national identity uh, and the idea of a Swedish nation. So that was the museums were, like everywhere around Europe, was a, a part of the of the uh, national uh, nation building in, in Europe. This was this collection was uh, from the they were war goodies, but they were also archaeological material. And the classification of all these things, these small things, ten million objects, the classification was based on the norms and values during the 19th century. So when we were digitalizing this classification system. The norms and values from the 19th century passed off because the tagging system of the collection is not different from in the 19th century. But we are living in another time now. But still, when you are searching in the digital collection, you cannot search for Turkey. You cannot search for uh, words or expressions that are uh, important for us today. We have to search for the tagging that was done in the 1860, or 1870, 1890. That limits our idea of history today. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. So the norms and values during the 19th century are actually defining the history we have in Sweden today. Because history is something that is always changing, depending on the situation, depending on research, but it's also depending on the political situation. The museums were formulated in the 19th century by the state and by the politicians. And the, uh, the tasks of the museums are always defined by the politicians. This is the museum I, I'm, I have been working with. Uh, the, the History Museum, they were uh, moving from the National Museum into this new building in 19. During the Second World War, Sweden was neutral, uh, but it was uh, it, but it was really important to kind of foster this idea of a Swedish nation, the Swedishness. So the first audience that came to this museum in 1943 and before that 1942 was soldiers. And the first exhibition I had, we, we had in this history museum was a military history. Uh, it was a military exhibition. But it was the absolutely best we had uh, in the military equipment in Sweden during the Second World War. Um, this is number one in the collection. Ten million objects, this is number one. Uh, it is from the 13th century. Uh, it is uh, the, 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 how you say, the keys case for uh, uh, the Holy Elizabeth. Uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, it's a war booty. So Sweden, Swedish soldiers were gathering this uh, this kind of objects uh, during the Thirty Years' War uh, in the 17th century. So this is 1632. <coughs> this comes to Sweden, and it becomes uh, later on uh, the first object in the in the collection. Uh, it had always been. It's beautiful. It's big. Uh, but it had always been exhibited as a war booty from the 30s war. There had not been any other information. But for me, uh, an object never had just one perspective or just one narrative. So when I started to work with my colleagues in the museum, I asked them, okay, what is the narratives of these objects, number one? And they came up with, I think it was like 30 different narratives that could be directly linked to this object. Because it's, uh, this, uh, this container is made from uh, um, gems and gold from different parts of the world. It's Arabic coins, uh, it is uh, jewelry from different, uh, different continents, uh, but it is also meaning of a secular history, uh, a Catholic history, uh, uh, but it's also about wars, uh, it is about war booties. So we, we collected at least 30 narratives that was relevant for this object. This is another object uh, of the museum. I will not bother you with a lot, we have a lot of beautiful stuff. But this is a, a very, uh, it's a silver ring. It was excavated on an island, a Viking grave, a woman. Uh, uh, and it's beautiful, it's really well preserved. The grave was very well preserved in Viking, uh, from Viking age. Uh, we have exhibited this ring always, but what we haven't mentioned, it is what is said on, the, on this glass bit. It says, for Allah. We never told that, because it doesn't fit into the grand narrative of Sweden. So, and we have a lot of this kind of material in the museum. Uh, we are telling one story, but we don't tell everything. Depending on different times, and this is not special for Sweden, this is what's happening all over the world. We tell some stories, but we don't tell everything. So can you imagine uh, what we have in our collections? We have everything. We just have to find ways of unfold the collections. To, to look at them in different perspectives. That I find very interesting. And that's why my movie, for example, what, an, uh, what a collection. If you start to look at this collection of photographies in a different perspective, with help of, of, of a lot of different kind of people. Treasures. Representation. Who is represented in national museums or historical museums? Uh, for example, in Sweden, but all over the place. This could, I told you about the classification of the objects in the museum in the 19th century. In the 19th century, race science was developed in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, Sweden was very prominent. We had very uh, great race, uh, race scientists in Sweden, but all around Europe. Uh, and uh, who would be defined Swedish was defined by the race science. Uh, uh, and that was nothing special. I mean, race science was something dominating all science in, in ideology, art history, you name it. So it was nothing special. Uh, but it, it was, um, how do you say that? That was uh, a way of also excluding people from the collections or narratives, or including people in the collections and in, in the narratives. This woman, uh, her name is Elsa Laula Rianberg. She is one of the Sami people, the minority in Sweden. She is not part of the collection. Her narrative is not a uh, part of the, of the collection, even if we have a lot of Sami material in the museum. Uh, she was uh, a prominent woman. She was born in the, 19th, in the end of the 19th century. Uh, she was um, the founder of a, the big association, the Sapmi Association, working for the rights of the Sapmi people. She, not, even, not just in Sweden, but in the Nordic countries. She was an activist during this period. And we have kind of erased her 
the narrative about her, the, the struggle she had together with her appear uh, at work. So representation in the museums, who is excluded and who is included in the narratives and the collections. I find that very important to think about. As I said, history is something that we create all the time. With new facts, historical facts, we add to, of course, the knowledge we have in the museums. But history is created for other reasons, but perhaps even more used for other reasons. We need history as individuals to kind of, we need our memories to create some kind of context for our lives, to understand ourselves. We need a set of memories and ideas and narratives to, to understand where we are in this society. Why, who am I? Uh, but it is also used for political reasons. It has always been used by uh, nations or uh, masters to mobilize groups in society. You know all about that. Uh, and you exclude some certain narratives and you include other uh, narratives. That's something that happens all the time. I was visiting, for example, South Africa. South Africa is a, from the 94, it's kind of a new situation. They have to create a new South African narrative. Who are they after apartheid? What kind of symbols do they use? What kind of narratives are important for them? What kind of myths do they use? When I was working in Serbia, I was a cultural attaché in Belgrade for four years. It, I thought it was very interesting to be in Serbia because they were creating their new national identity somehow. Uh, but they were using very much the religious symbols, myths. Historical facts, but also a lot of myths. Poland is doing the same today. There are, you can see countries all around the world that are need to use different kinds of narratives to create some kind of idea of a, of a belonging, of a nation, because that's also important for us. But we also uh, use history for regional development, for uh, city development, for uh, commercial reasons. This is just one uh, one of the, I mean, we have in Sweden cities that are living on history, the result to, to gather, uh, to, uh, to get the tourists coming, for example. Uh, I was employed uh, at the Swedish History Museum in 2015 to do this exhibition, History Unfolds. The museum is a prominent, one of the biggest museums in Sweden. They, since in 2008, they started to talk about, okay, how can we invite uh, artists to work together with us? Because we need help to kind of unfold the, the collections. So we do that. So I was employed as a curator, uh, and I will tell you a little bit about it. Um, it was an international, uh, uh, international Exhibition. It was just one Swedish artist. Uh, we created five new. We did five new productions, uh, inviting artists to work with our researchers and with our collections. The artists were working at least one year, long term work, really long term. Uh, and the, um, the the artworks were exhibited inside the exhibition, permanent exhibition. So not the white box. Not in separate spaces, but inside the exhibitions. But we needed help because I believe that uh, uh, museum professional people, we are great. I mean, we're really professional. We know what we, we are talking about. But we need, if we want to see something invisible, or if we want to get out of the norm, because the norm is always invisible, how can we actually unfold something in our own practice? We need help. So uh, we, during one and a half year, we invited other people. We invited artists. This is a professor, uh, uh, Stefan Jungusson. We invited uh, uh, um, experts of different kinds to make guided tours in our permanent exhibitions, but with the task to look at what is missing or what is itching. 
So uh, this was, an, uh, was a guided tour that the two people did um, about the Swedish colonial. Col colonial, or no? Past. And these people were, uh, they of course saw a lot of missing information in the museum. Uh, we recorded these uh, guided tours. They were fully booked. Everyone wanted to listen to these people, uh, and they, everyone was really kind of, "Are you kidding us? Are you going to invite people to criticize you and your exhibitions?" Uh, and we recorded all this, and the material is used by, by the professionals at the museum to change inside the exhibitions because we are missing a lot of perspectives. We did, I think, like 15 of these guided tours on different topics. It could be um, um, freedom of speech or nationalism or um, the Sami, the minorities in Sweden, and so on. What we did after these guided tours, we gathered uh, different kind of people in a circle. I just tell you, this is a method. It's four people in the circle. It's one artist, one curator is a filmmaker, uh, and it's the head of uh, the Afro-Swedish Association in Sweden. Uh, and they were talking about uh, the Swedish colonial past. Uh, and the audience are sitting around them listening, and the audience cannot interfere in the conversation. This sounds simple, but you get a completely different relationship when you're sitting and you're talking with with just a few people around you, you get a, a completely different kind of debate or discussion. Um, and we did uh, many of these discussions, and you can find them all on the website, uh, the History, Swedish History Museum. Some of them, many of them are in English. Uh, I just wanted to show you uh, an example of uh, one new artist uh, that we invited, Akshinevsky, he's from Poland. He did a work called Them. Uh, have you seen it? So, this is a very strong work. It's an old work of Artur Zmierski. He's invited four different uh, groups in Poland uh, to, uh, to, to paint their symbol. That is more, most important for them. It's like the Catholic women, it's a nationalistic group, it's a, it's a, a peace organization, and uh, I think it is also a fascist youth organization. And they are right, they are doing their symbols. Next workshop they can interact with the symbols. And it, it ends with a completely disaster. The, the place is burning. Uh, and I wanted to show this work in this history museum because the history museum is full with symbols, but it is a symbol in itself of a nation of values and norms in the in a, in a society. Another work uh, is James Webb, he's a South African artist. Uh, the museum has a huge collection of uh, church art from the medieval time. Uh, and uh, it's just Catholic material. Uh, even if there was Muslim communities, Jewish communities in Sweden during this period when the, the, the collection was was founded, uh, we still just have Catholic material. And because of the lack of other religious expression, we invited James Webb to, and he did a recording of prayers from all religious expressions in Stockholm. It's seven hours of prayers. Uh, I think it's like 42 different songs and hymns. Uh, and they are in these uh, speakers. Uh, and they are inside uh, this space. And it is one sound piece, but you can also kneel down and you can listen to each and every prayer. It's a fantastic work, actually. Uh, and it's in, the, it's in dialogue with the religious object, or it's not an even, it's not religious object anymore, but these museum objects, um, and it's, it's really a fantastic piece. But, I would like to show you, uh, I want the artists to speak to you. Uh, I invited uh, a Finnish artist, Mina Henriksson. She had been in, in Albania so many times. Do you know her? 
Mina, Mina is she she really loves Albania, uh, and she's here a lot. But I invited her. She's a she's a, an artist. She's very interested in the Finnish society and the, the relation with the Nazis during the Second World War. Uh, and uh, she's uh, I have to tell you the background. My colleague, the head of research at the museum, he wrote a book about race science in Sweden uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and in his book, he tried to make a mapping of the race science institutes in Sweden and how they were connected. And when I saw this map, I thought of Minna because she had made this kind of mapping and I uh, sent her the book, I gave her the book of Frederick, and I said, are you interested in this topic? And she, she said, yes. And they started to collaborate, the two of them. So this is collaboration between the head of research and Minna as an artist, and uh, she will tell you what she's doing. Um, I think that working with him has uh, actually opened many doors for this project, uh, which, which I, as an artist by myself, would have maybe not been able to, to open. The project is roughly from 1850s to 1945. Uh, it is about uh, the race science practiced in the Nordic countries. Um, so it is, it is, uh, it is about the, the scientists and about the institutions where they were practicing this race science and where they were collecting uh, human remains. But it is also about, for example, about the skull collectors, um, about the artists who were collaborating with the race scientists and producing images. Uh, out of this theory and this logic of thinking. I think that the race science of those days had a, had a very big impact on how humans were portrayed. So, so what was the Germanic, Aryan, Nordic master race type uh, in comparison to people from other parts of the world. When a viewer enters a history museum, um, the viewer takes everything as a, as a, as a fact and does not question the, the information which is in the museum. So, so anything that you put in a history museum has a very different kind of seriousity than if you put it in an art exhibition. Yeah, if I, if I would show the same thing in an art exhibition, um, you might get people asking, is this true or is it fiction? Like, many people would not believe that it is true, but I hope that, that here in the history museum people take it seriously, because it is fact. So in this research, when we were going to different uh, institutions in Stockholm and elsewhere in Sweden and then in Helsinki as well, uh, yeah, I was uh, I was quite surprised. But so so we we saw a lot of human remains actually. So so there are um, a lot of these skulls, for example, in in these storages. Some institutions have found boxes of, of skulls and other human remains and 
and now they are a bit puzzled with what to do with all this. I and also Frederick uh, do not see any value in in showing original human remains, for example. And, and also there's a lot of other uh, ethical questions that that go into what is being displayed. Somehow I'm very interested in this this cross between that science and then the productions uh, uh, in art and other kind of visual visualizations uh, and how they have possibly influenced uh, the ideas of, of what uh, what do themes look like or sweets or so. It's uh, I, I think that they have played a, a great role in that and still continue to do it because because many of those uh, those uh, productions, those artworks, and so they 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 are still today valued as um, somehow national treasures. So I think that it is very important to to know the past and to know what has happened and what has been discussed in the past and what has been practiced in the past in science and and how it has been leaking to other other spheres like like art productions, for example, um, because uh, I think that uh, that somehow this history could repeat unless we are very careful. with Mina and Henrik, uh, Frederick's work is that this is actually uh, the first mapping of race science in the Nordic countries between 1850 to 1945. It doesn't exist uh, until now. Uh, and uh, it's still on the wall of the museum because the museum has decided that this artwork has to stay because it has influenced so much the classification of the collections and the practice we are having in the museum. So we need to have this as, uh, as an important information when we are working in museums. Uh, I have, what's the time? Oh, well, I have a little bit more time. Uh, as I said, there were five new productions and uh, and uh, another, I don't know how much, there is no air inside here, and perhaps we get you know, more, I don't know. No, it's fine. It's fine, uh, because there are uh, some more there. Oh, I did interviews with all these five artists, but you can see them on YouTube, you find them. But perhaps, and they are five minutes long, I can perhaps show two more, is that fine with you? Yes. Uh, because Esther Schallert, I do that. Esther Schallert Gerrit, she is uh, an artist painting in Paris. Uh, perhaps you have seen some of her work. Uh, she is a um, very strong uh, artist and very, uh, she knows what she wants. And I met her in Sweden and she, she had been working as a professor in an art institution in Sweden. Years, and she said, you Swedes are so naive. Uh, you're so naive and you have absolutely no idea about your history. Uh, she's, she was so upset with us uh, because Swedish people don't know so much about their history, actually. Uh, and she said the gold room in the Swedish History Museum, we have one of the most important and visited uh, exhibitions in the museum is the gold room. We have gold, beautiful things like this in the gold room. Uh, and uh, the funny thing is, we are presenting this as Swedish heritage. This is the Swedish history. But none, almost none of these things in the gold room is made in Sweden. We didn't have gold mines in Sweden during the Viking Age. We didn't have the crafts people to make these whole things. So most of the material comes from other parts of the world. Some of them uh, came through the Vikings when they were trading, uh, but uh, we don't tell that story. 
Yeah. We present it as the Swedish heritage, but we don't tell, tell about the source. Much of this material, this beautiful stuff, comes from Spain, from Turkey, now Turkey, uh, different parts of Europe, China. <coughs> we don't tell it. Still today, we don't tell this story. And as they said, <coughs> I am so fed up with this. You shouldn't talk about the gold room, the Swedish, the Swedish uh, heritage. This is a culture room. This is a global exhibition. Global narratives. And uh, she said, I want to work with this, uh, with this material. So I connected her with my colleagues in the museum. Uh, and she, uh, she, uh, I will tell you because I don't think she's telling that. She, she wanted to interview five of the museum staff about certain objects that were picking from the order of the collection and describe them. And because we don't have any uh, text uh, that can uh, tell anything about this material, because they were excavated, this gold, mainly, uh, it's we, we are not certain about these objects. We can think that we know, but we, and sometimes we a little bit more we know, but sometimes less. And then she also invited five persons that right now are refugees in Sweden and many of them just brought one object uh, because she wanted to prove that it is not because of the gold that people are uh, taking with them the material to, uh, the Vikings took this gold to Sweden but it is because they have a, another kind of value uh, and that is what she's stressing a square in the middle of it and this square is uh, is like a gold leaf. Gold leaf is very, very, very thin in reality. It's very thin and very fragile. It's done from gold. And you can cover everything. And you'll never know that actually it's wood or other materials. And it will become gold in our imagination. So it go. I conceived it in the video by using what the surrealists did because my feeling about the whole world is surrealist. So the surrealists, they use a, a procedure called solarization. Solarization, you take an image of Maya, and then you take the negative and the positive, you put them one on top of each other. So they cover each other, but they actually reveal something. It's seldom actually that we see the refugees speaking about their story or speaking their mind. We we'll always hear other people tell us how many were saved, became, how many they are against or for, but we never see them. I think we are in an acute, acute, a very acute moment. And I think you need acute means to deal with it. I think emotions are the most beautiful things that are. And create the memory in us, and create a, a sympathy in us, and, and, and create that we, when we laugh about something, we remember it. When we cry about something, we remember it. It's really important because it's always lacking a lot and it's our duty in a way to understand why is it written the way it's written because if history is uh, is only said by one voice it's already not true we have to know that deficit is enormous but it's our imagination and the imagination of the scientists around history that can revive a little bit uh, so, and Esther Schallergert's work, she is still in, uh, in the museum, and you, you can hear that she's kind of challenging the museum or the idea of the museum. Uh, 
uh, which is very uh, interesting. And that is also something that um, a lot of uh, artists are doing and are permitted to do in, in Sweden uh, right now. Um, I, this is the last thing I will tell you about. This is a Serbian artist called Dusi Jadrasic. When I met her in Sweden, I told her about a collection that was invisible in the museum. No one, almost no one knew about it. Very few were interested. It was one person, one artist in the <coughs> museum that was interested in this material, and I was thrilled about this material. It is 10 tons of earth samples. Uh, earth samples you collect when you make excavations, you collect earth because perhaps there is some information in the, in the earth that you don't, uh, that you cannot find, or you cannot, uh, how do you say, reach uh, in the moment you're excavating. It can be seeds, it can be bone, it can be human remains, it can be a lot of different things. But we have 10 tons of earth samples in the collection, and they are stored like this in plastic bags, in cigarette uh, boxes, in uh, it's huge. And when I told Dusic about this material, she said, I need to see it. So I connected her with the archaeologist that knows anything about this material. I put them together, and they were working together for a year. Uh, uh, because Dusic has a very strong feeling about this material. She, uh, as someone that is living in the exile, uh, yeah, you will hear she's talking about. But this is a material that uh, the museum really don't talk about. They rather would like to uh, not deal with it at all. Uh, they really would like to throw it away. This exhibition was for one year. We created a publication. What was very interesting that we had a lot of audience. A lot of our schools came. Uh, a lot of other kind of schools, uh, but also the archaeologues and so on, they came. Because this is a way of working when you're working interdisciplinary, uh, with researchers, artists, with uh, uh, thinkers, with uh, professionals, with, the, with educators. <coughs> and when you're working together, something new can unfold. And this is something that um, really is inspiring. It's a challenge for the museums to work in this way. Because if you never, in my museum, if you never have been working with artists before, how do you dare? Uh, but still, uh, my first meeting with my steering group at the museum was that perhaps the artists will do something that we don't like. But we still need to support them to do what they want. And another thing, and they had to promise. They had to sign that. Another thing they had to promise me was that this could be a mistake, this exhibition. That this, it had to be a possibility that we would not be successful. That was very important for me, because it's a risk to invite other people to actually work in a, in a state institution with collections like this. You have to have brave bosses and some kind of learning experience for also the staff. So we, with all the stuff, we have education about what is contemporary art, what is use of history, what is education uh, and art, because they never worked with that before. How do you communicate contemporary art? We had to learn all that things. That's why you need time and a uh, lot and lot of work. But I think the museum is. Uh, uh, have gained a lot uh, from this collaboration. Uh, and uh, they are continuing to work with artists. I'm not there anymore, but they are continuing to work with artists. Can, can yes, you can ask. Yes. I would like to ask you, this unfolding the history, yes. is something that you only have started, or is in all the museums of, of Sweden that have started like a process? Because this rethinking of history, especially in, in communist country in Europe. It's very common today. Yes. But I would like to ask if this is a trend of the creator or is 
institutional policy or something. How it, uh, how it came out this yeah. relooking to the history? There's a lot of history museums in Sweden, big and small, that uh, are working with artists. Uh, what was special with this, that is that uh, the, the first formulate, it was first formulated in 2008. So it was a long journey until 2015 when they were employing me. Uh, and uh, uh, what was also different from the history of politics was that we were working so long time uh, with the artists, uh, more than a year, and that we were exhibiting the artworks in the permanent exhibitions. A lot of museums are doing this uh, as a way of trying to unfold their collections or try to get other perspectives of, of the museums. Some are doing fantastic works, and some are less. But you have to try it because the staff have to be mature, and the institution has to be mature, the artists have to be comfortable in a situation in perhaps a state institution. I mean, there are so many things that has to match. And then you have to have curators that can match a collection with researchers and with artists. So have, it is a, from the beginning, this was, uh, the promise was we want to make history more complex and our work much more complicated. That's an aim for us, that's a goal for us. Uh, and uh, this is the way we did it. And, but the people from the municipality or from the government, yes. how they accept this? Because I, I want to yes. understand if there is a conflict or if there is very natural of this way of working. Uh, there is a new museum law in Sweden that, uh, and there is a principle in Sweden that the politician should have an arm's length distance to the decision making. Meaning that the government cannot interfere with the state institutions, uh, how do you say, uh, work. So the, the government are giving the museums uh, instructions, but they are very fluffy. And then it's up to the institutions to make their own programs. So the government, they have nothing to do with the, the, the decisions. And it's important to have that arm's length distance because otherwise you have a very strong political agenda in the museums. Of course we are, we are financed by the government uh, and we get the, some kind of instruction from the government but they cannot interfere with what the museums are doing. It's different on the local level, the small museum, the uh, uh, that's a little bit uh, another situation, but the state museum, like these big, huge ones, uh, they are um, uh, kind of safeguard, but still they are political institutions. <laughs> and uh, you would say in Sweden right now there is a fight for history. Uh, there are certain organizations or uh, movements <coughs> that want to safeguard God, the grand narrative of Sweden. And then there are other people like myself that want to explore history and to see what can we find because it's, we have an enormous resource but we are not able to, to find any material because they, 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 they are tagged in such a strange way and, we cannot find anything in the collections. Yes, uh, I have another question. Uh, as you are uh, continuously working on uh, building narratives, do you have educational problems? And uh, what's coming up from these uh, educational activities? Uh, there are uh, in the this So is there something new in the treatment of, of the narrative? Uh, uh, this museum have a tradition of working with uh, use of history. Uh, the educators, they have, we have, I think it's nine or ten educators, uh, they are very skilled on, on having programs about use of history. Uh, uh, in the curriculum, the Swedish curriculum for, uh, not preschool, for high school and gymnasium, use of history and the creation of history is part of the curriculum. So the, the, the pupils should know how this works. And so creation is the creation and the use. For what reasons are you using? How do you create this thing? How do you actually use it? So we have educators that are doing 
doing these guided tours, the educational programs, everything, uh, with big classes, with small classes, and talking about these issues, about the Viking Age, for example. So, uh, and that is, so the museum, we're very ready, because we had, uh, we had this knowledge. But then to work with artists that do something else, another layer of uh, knowledge, like Nina's work yeah. in the way science, uh, that's another kind of layer of knowledge that is important for us. And the guided, uh, the, uh, um, the tour guides that were working in the exhibition, this exhibition, they loved it because it, they could they could pose completely different questions uh, about the, the, the construction of the museum and the collections and the way we are using the museums. Fun. They loved it. Uh, of course, you have always people that come and get very upset that we are kind of not questioning history, we don't do that, but we're trying to kind of make it a little bit more complex, not make it simple. Um, but that tells with you. Sounds? Yes? Uh, can you know narratives of the museum and the display change after this, uh, let's say, intervention? Yeah. We have two, still two artworks, uh, Esther Chalogier, Sister Sean, and Minas. The museum decided to have both of them there because they are very important. Uh, unfortunately, the other artists' artworks is not there. Uh, but for example, um, the labels, um, the ring, the silver ring, the Viking ring, now we are telling the other story. For our love, it says. And there are a lot of these kind of objects in the museum. Now they are getting other labels. Uh, and the guided tours we did, as I told you, with the with other perspective of this of our exhibitions, that material uh, uh, are used to change the, the permanent exhibitions. So we are adding and we are taking away different stories and we are adding because we need to do that. It's, we cannot not uh, work with this individual perspectives. And, and also the audience are demanding that from us. We have started something, they want more. Uh, so the demand of this kind of uh, investigation in the collections and, and the museum history is great. And I still do, even the museum, uh, the exhibition is not there anymore, I still do guided tours. In the exhibition uh, in the, uh, with the artworks that doesn't exist anymore, but it doesn't matter because it, I can still talk about it, and they want me to talk about it. I still do it. I do a lot of guided tours and lectures and art schools to talk. about How do you do this? It's not easy. It's really hard work, uh, and, and you need to be very uh, take care of the artists. Uh, but also the staff and to really connect people and make the situation as good as it can be. Keep it here at the art house. Uh, uh, I am re invited uh, researchers to kind of unfold uh, Swedish history in different ways. Uh, so there is an articles about that. Um, and there is information about artists. You can also find all these films, the five ones. Uh, there are Lucicha, for example, working with the, their samples, or uh, Elizabeth Wood that did a, a fantastic knitting textile artist, uh, or James Webb, is working with his prayers uh, with his own. So you can find them. You can also find a lot of material on the website with the program activities, everything. And uh, I'm available and happy to Uh, if you are in Stockholm, if you are visiting Stockholm, there is still, we did actually two exhibitions. There is one exhibition that is called uh, A Reflection, where we are uh, dealing with material from the museum and we try to unfold it in what I told you about, different perspectives. So that exhibition is still on. So if you are in Stockholm, you can always see it. Thank you. Thank you.